Moss is a magnificent life form. It's existed on our planet 450 million years before we started calling it our planet. There are over 12,000 species of moss spanning across all continents. That's right, even the poles. They are of the greater family Bryophytes, a group of non-vascular flora, meaning they lack true roots, stems, and leaves. In fact, they don't have any form of specialized vascular system to move the squishy fluids around. Instead, they absorb water and nutrients from whatever surface they happen to be growing on. And rather than use seeds like the pedestrian flora, they have adopted the way of the ancients. They reproduce through spores. Spore sacs, activate! I have been using temperate mosses in my terrariums for close to 8 years now, with great success. In today's video, I'll be showing you how to identify, collect, protocol, and propagate mosses. Maybe even start your own moss farm. Welcome to the microverse. Let's start with identification. These are all temperate mosses that I have obtained from nature. Let's take a closer look at each one so you can better identify these mosses while you are out and about. We'll start with the most common. Hypnum moss often has a fluffy formation that spreads horizontally across the surface. There are a few species within the hypnum family, but they all have the same general texture and range in color from deep green to light green to yellow green. Hypnum moss can be found attached to tree bark or in your backyard. Badge moss. Badge moss is unisexual, meaning there is a female and male form of the plant. Both sport the teardrop-shaped leaves that are semi-translucent. The male grows these leaves flat, while the female arranges them in a star formation. Also known as bog moss, it can be found near bodies of water, or in your backyard. Star moss. Very much as the name suggests, this moss grows in compact clumps of star-shaped leaves. Newer growth tends to be a more vibrant green than the old growth and sometimes changes the shade of green based on the ambient humidity. Star moss likes to grow as pillows on damp, hard surfaces, and can often be found growing out of cracks in the pavement. Fern moss. Again, they give it away with the name. When examined closely, this moss grows in a formation resembling a fern, and is one of those mosses where you gotta get a closer look to be able to identify it properly. With vibrant greens and carpeting abilities, this moss loves the hardscape and can often be found growing on rocks near or around bodies of water. Pincushion moss. This urchin-looking moss has cone-like leaves sprouting from a singular point, much like a pincushion, again with the names. It will likely be pale green out in nature, but can get a deep green when established in higher humidity. Clumps can be found growing on hard surfaces or the understory of coniferous forests. Sphagnum moss. One of the largest mosses that I have found in the area the greater Ottawa area. From pale green to deep green, sometimes even red, this moss as its dry form has been used in botany for decades. It was even used in World War II as an absorbent alternative to cotton. It can be found in bogs and swamps, or in very high humidity, perma-wet environments. Fun fact, moss contains a type of bacteria called cyanobacteria that helps fix the soil especially in nitrogen-limited ecosystems, like bogs and swamps. Yesterday, I went on a hike with my very good friend Greg. And if you're wondering what a hike with the inspector of mosses looks like, here are some highlights. It involves a lot of, ooh, look at that moss. Oh, a froggo or toad of some sort. Ooh, a miniature tapestry of varied mosses. What manner of bird is that? Mmm, this is good hardscape inspiration. Must fluff the moss. More hardscape inspiration. Golden sand reflecting the sunlight. <laughs> Beavers were here. Ooh, look at this fungi. 
and this adorable smushy slug. The Protocol In this naturally acquired clump of moss, there might exist quite the bit of biodiversity. Not all of these creatures, or microfauna if you will, are desirable in a very closed environment. But if let's say you're propagating this moss for use in a terrarium with a life form, like a crested gecko or a ball python or a fire-bellied toad, for example, this would not be ideal. You would not want a hitchhiker out from nature to come in and disrupt your already existing ecosystem within that terrarium. And thus enters the protocol. For a clump of moss like this haircap moss, take a pair of scissors. Speaking of undesired hitchhikers, there's like a bug right here. I don't know what this bug is. I don't know what it can do to a springtail population or what a greater population of it can do to a terrarium. Just to be on the safe side, I'm going to remove as much debris as I can with the scissors. What I do next is I wash the moss. I simply just run it through the tab and just fluff it with my hand and try to get all of the dirt and gunk and stuff out of the bottom side. After I do that, we are going to submerge this moss entirely. If there are air breathing undesirables within this moss, they will quickly be expunged. Oh, there's a spider there. You see what I mean? If that guy got into a terrarium by accident, it will most likely devastate the springtail colony that is within that terrarium, and thus eliminating an essential part of the cleanup crew of any terrarium. So I'm gonna be leaving this moss in the water for a minimum of two hours and a maximum of 24 hours. It's been, I wanna say about four hours since we soaked this stuff. Did you know that mosses are often home to the most indestructible animal on the face of the planet? They're called tardigrades, commonly known as water bears or moss piglets. How adorable. They can survive radiation, extreme frigid temperatures, yes, even the Arctic. They have even survived the vacuum of space. Ooh, a life form. Did you know that this video was made for lifeforms? If you want to keep seeing videos about lifeforms, hit, hit buttons, hit, hit any button, buttons. Now that the moss has been identified, collected, washed, and dunked, let's set up a prop box. I'll be using this shallow transparent storage box. I drill a few holes in the lid for ventilation. For substrate, I'm using a potting mix that contains some perlite, which will provide the aeration needed within the substrate. Before I categorize the mosses and place them in their specialized bin, as an added measure, I am placing them in a community bin. It's actually an old aquarium. And adding springtails so they can tackle any initial mold outbreaks. I will leave the mosses in this community bin for about two weeks before I add the moss into the moss farm. Speaking of the farm, here is my setup. I found this awesome storage rack on Amazon. I'll put an affiliate link in the description for you. The storage boxes I obtained from my local dollar store. I'm sure you'll be able to find something suitable. For lighting, I am using the Brina T5 full spectrum lights, also obtained from Amazon. I'll also put a link to this in the description in case you want this exact same setup. They are linkable and I have them set on a timer with a 12 hour on, 12 hour off cycle. After I am confident the moss has no issues, I will move that moss into its species specific bin and then into the moss farm. I will usually let the moss grow for about a month or two before using it in any of my builds. And now you are a fully fledged moss inspector. If you would like more moss content, here you go. If you would like some inspiration with which to build, here's a playlist. If you haven't yet, click, click this button. Yeah, that one there. May the moss be with you.